So uh, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for attending uh, this uh, building capacity in cybersecurity session. Uh, the moderator of this uh, session uh, is Mr. S uh, Peter Stevens. Uh, he's from the OECD, and uh, he will be uh, participating online from Paris. So, um, Peter, can you he, can he hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, Good great. Everyone. So, uh, if you're ready, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and welcome everyone to this session on capacity building on cybersecurity. Um, as was said, my name is Peter Stevens, and I'm at the OECD, um, looking on digital security. And uh, today we've got a fantastic panel. Um, so before we start, can I please um, pass over to uh, introductions? Um, uh, can I please pass to Ms. Sh uh, Shinoda, please? Me first? Sure. Yeah, I'll just say my name. Uh, yeah, I'm Kana Shinoda, and I'm from uh, Kodru. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm Chris Painter. I'm the president of the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise, uh, former US government cyber diplomat, among other things. So very nice to be here in Japan. Uh, I'm Tomo Yamauchi, uh, Director General for Cybersecurity uh, at Ministry of International Affairs and Communication, MIC Japan. Thank you very much. And it's a great pleasure to have such a, a, a fantastic group of panelists today. Um, we all know um, that cybersecurity is very much an international problem that requires a lot of international partnerships in order to respond to them. Um, we know that, that uh, cybercrime is interconnected and the way that technology can be weaponized across borders is an ongoing challenge. If we just take one example of the Mirai attack in 2016, uh, we saw that 61 simple username and passwords was able to compromise 600,000 devices across Brazil, Colombia, and Vietnam. And then those products were able to be weaponized to damage and cause a harm in the US, Liberia, and also in Germany. Um, governments cannot operate in isolation, and we need to work in partnership with one another to boost resilience from cyber threat. Um, and we know that this issue continues to evolve. Um, what, what is an issue now will not be an issue forever and more problems will continue to come. So there is a need for all countries to adapt and to prepare for those future threats within new and emerging technologies. As we know, there's a lot of interest now in artificial intelligence and also as things develop in quantum as well. So there's a really important question about how can we build capacity in two, in two ways. So I always think about capacity building as a combination of the cross-country capacity building, which is how can high capacity countries support lower capacity countries? Um, and that's the supporting to the development of international norms, as well as helping governments to set the foundations by delivering meaningful policy to address market failure and promote strong cybersecurity practices. There's also a challenge of how can we move from strategy to the delivery of, of law in countries and how can we implement government uh, approaches to help set those expectations on industry, which of course all operate globally. As well as the regional component, there's also an important component, which is about how can we help time-based capacity building? How can we prepare for the future? How can we make sure that we have sufficient skill sets and a diverse group community of people who are working in cybersecurity? I most recently was at a, a DEF CON conference in the United States and there was a, a really passionate discussion around the distinction between um, cybersecurity skills and also how can we prepare for the workforce? How can we make sure that more people are able to find the right roles in cybersecurity to help them um, to, to make big impact and to help support um, industry and also the, the, the wider economy? So we saw that already with things like the cyber workforce strategy in the United States but also there's a need for further partnerships between these communities. So I know that there's a lot of work helping to bridge the gap between cybersecurity professionals and also policymakers who historically have not worked in partnership perhaps through a number of different reasons which we might go into. And I think it's really interesting to see how that is continuing to evolve and that relationship changing. So I'm looking forward to hearing from, from participants about that as well. So as we say, we have a one hour session here today um, so we will have three presentations from each of our panelists before going into a 20 minutes of discussion 
and then there will be five minutes of questions and answers um, towards the end. So if you do have questions, please do make a note of them and there will be time for them at the end of the session. Um, so without further ado, um, I would love to, to pass over um, to, to Chris Painter, who's president of the GFCE, the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise. And what I'd really love you to do, Chris, if you could tell us a bit more about the work that the GFCE is doing and how it is supporting policymakers to address cybersecurity threats around the world. Great. Thank you, Peter. And first, let me just say how much of a pleasure it is to be here. I mean, back in Japan, uh, which I've, uh, especially when I was with the U.S. government, had uh, worked with a lot over the years and really valued that interaction on cyber uh, security, other kinds of cyber issues. And so it's, you know, thank you to our hosts. I know how much work it is to put on something like this. So thank you for that. I really appreciate it. Um, so let me just put the first slide up that I have or someone put up the first slide. Okay, there. Um, so when I think about cyber capacity building, I think it's uh, really foundational to everything we're trying to do, not just to fight threats online, uh, of which there are many and growing, but also it's the foundation for achieving all the good things. And so you know, all the digital economy, digitization, all the things we talk about, uh, and it will empower countries, empower individuals, uh, cybersecurity, having good cybersecurity is key to that, and having capacity building to enable countries to do that is also very important. Uh, so let's go to that next slide. Uh, the GFC is basically an organization that was set up as a response, an international response to this global challenge because many countries and individuals and organizations around the world are now faced with these threats but don't really have the capability to deal with them. And that's particularly true in the, the global south, the global majority, uh, who are dealing with these issues. And again, it's really their economies are depending on it. Um, and it's meant to close the cybersecurity capacity gap because there is a large one between more developed countries and less developed countries. But even within the developed countries, there's, there are gaps that need to be addressed. And the point of the GFC is to help countries and organizations put uh, foundational building blocks to help with cyber resilience. And we use cyber resilience because that that phrase, I think, has more currency, more buy-in from communities outside the cybersphere, uh, the development sphere and others. Peter mentioned um, sometimes the breakdown between policymakers and, and uh, technical experts, certainly that's there. But there's also, I think, a breakdown between different communities of interest, people who do economic policy, people who do security policy, people who are in the development community, traditional development community like the, the SDGs, and folks who do cybersecurity capacity building. We can't afford those communities to be different. They need to be brought together. So we identify successful policies, best practices, and ideas so that we can both share them between regions and individuals, but also in countries, but also multiply their effect on a global level. Go to the next slide. So basically the GFC, which is an organization of now 200 members and partners, including about 60 countries, including Japan, the US, and many others, uh, civil society, uh, industry, uh, a true multi-stakeholder organization. Uh, the overall vision is to fully reap the benefits of, of uh, ICT through a free, open, peaceful, and secure digital world. And the mission is to strengthen cybersecurity capacity building and do that. And what we try to do, and this is really important, and this is something I saw when I was uh, in the government, is you can't, sim the resources are pretty uh, slim in this area. And often what happened is five different countries would train the same five people in the country over and over and over again, or not really ask them what they needed, and therefore the, the resources were some, somewhat misspent uh, by duplicating efforts and not really having a, a strategic plan in place. So one of our core things is to avoid that duplication to help coordinate projects uh, and to really coordinate these efforts. And also to help improve the efficiency and effectiveness of products, both by coordination, but also being able to share knowledge more fully uh, among different stakeholders. And then map and then fill capacity building gaps, which is critically important too. And then finally, to help develop uh, research, to look at what the gaps are, see if we can commission research and projects. Uh, so we have a research agenda, a clearinghouse, so if a country says we need help with X, we match that country with donors and implementers who are part of the GFC community. Uh, knowledge sharing we do through a portal, which I'll talk about in a second. Coordination is really our race and detra. Next uh, slide. So the, the key things I uh, mentioned, the research agenda is what I just mentioned is, is uh, commissioning research that fit, fill, fills the gaps where we identify gaps in the mapping that's done through the various people in the GFC community. The clearinghouse is where a country 
says, I need help. For instance, we've had a country come to us recently, an African country, saying, I need a national strategy. So there are lots of national strategies out there. There are lots of best practices, which we provide to them, but we can also match them with people who can really walk them through and help that process and make sure it's sustainable. And the Sybil Portal, which is at www civilportal.org, which is open to everyone, all of you can look at this, which is a collection of now hundreds of best practices, other documents along a number of different areas, both regionally, ser regionally searchable, but also more broadly in various, uh, various national strategies, diplomacy, cybercrime, uh, incident response and certs, standards, uh, all of those are, are mirrored in that portal and I, I recommend it to all of you. Next slide. So this is a breakdown of what's on the civil portal. Uh, as I said, it's a repository for cyber capacity building projects. It is a central uh, portal. It's also linked to the Unidir portal, and we cross-link between us of some of the work they've done. Now over 200 publications, 830 projects, 120 tools, and over 800 actors, um, including regional actors, and I think that's really important because some things are really specific to particular regions, uh, and that helps people really fill the need, the crying need that they have, for more help uh, and also points them to directions where they can get more help. Next slide. Um, this gives you a regional breakdown uh, uh, too uh, from really all over the world um, uh, you know, that we have projects, uh, projects, actors, and, and a number of upcoming events. We also have a calendar built on this, which I think helps people see what are all the upcoming events, and there are many uh, in this area. Next. Um, so our priorities coming forward are to uh, expand global cooperation, expand our network, focusing on inclusivity from all, every region around the world, regional coordination to bring, bridge the gap uh, both on a national and global level. And one of the things I've heard often is, and this has been a move we've been doing, a demand-driven approach. So listening to the people who want the help rather than saying, here's a program you know, we, we can give you, or a country saying, here's a program we can give you, really listening and doing that demand-driven approach, um, and, and doing work on a regional hubs to do that, and local collaboration uh, by connecting local projects with a larger global GFC ecosystem. Next slide. Uh, part of the reason, way we've done that, recognizing that global uh, efforts are important, but you also have to have regional efforts that are more to the ground, closer to the ground, so I just came from Fiji, where we launched our Pacific Hub. Uh, former director of the Tonga CERT is running that. It's for the Pacific Islands. It's really linked there, uh, and it's really meant to uh, help their needs. And they particularly are some of the places that said, look, everyone wants to give us aid, but we can't really, we don't even have the capacity to deal with that aid because it's duplicative often. They say, here's a, how to build a CERT 101. We get that 12 different times where we need how to build a CERT 102, and we need to put this in the larger context. So the Pacific Hub uh, I, I just launched. Really look forward to that. Uh, we have in the Latin America and Caribbean region, we are partnering with the Organization for American States to do a regional hub there. Uh, we have an Africa hub and created an African Cyber Experts Group. Uh, and then uh, the Southeast Asia hub and liaison uh, we have an ASEAN liaison based in Singapore that's just starting to work, and I think that's, again, for this region in particular, is going to be really important, uh, working with Japan and other countries to make sure that we're really listening to the region and amplifying efforts that are out there. Next slide. Uh, which leads me to the last uh, thing I want to touch on. Um, so I mentioned these different communities, the development community, the traditional development community, the cyber community, and others, and bringing them together. And we are having a major conference in Ghana and uh, Accra at the end of November, 29th and 30th of November, uh, for several things. One, to highlight and elevate this issue of cyber resilience as a priority in international and national development agenda. Now, we all know, who deal with this area, that increasingly cybersecurity undergirds every kind of infrastructure project you can think about, water, power, financial systems. Yet it's not given the attention I think it deserves to make sure that those development projects succeed in the long term with strong cybersecurity. So how can we bring those communities together to really uh, leverage each other's efforts and not make these opposing things but things that are built together? And that's really the point, the uh, overall point of this, and also to bring more attention to capacity building in the cyber area uh, globally. It's the first of its kind of event. It's going to have leaders, decision makers, experts from all over the world. Uh, I say it's hosted in Ghana to be opened by the Ghana president. Um, 
we're bringing the development folks in, we're bringing the cyber folks in, we're bringing regional efforts. Uh, we're going to have some regional discussions from each of the regions I talked about. It's really going to be, a, it's been a massive undertaking. We've been planning it for a while, uh, but I think it's going to be really important. Next slide. Uh, so I mentioned some of the, the, the outcomes of this. Really, it's to elevate and mainstream cyber resilience and capacity building in that development agenda. Uh, we want that to be a high-level global cyber capacity building agenda for going forward based on regional agendas. We're planning on launching uh, something called the, uh, well, we're, I think it's going to be called the ACRA call right now. We're still working on the phrasing, um, which is going to be a, a set of high-level action item principles so, you know, there are lots of principles out there, including cybersecurity principles that we've done, that the UN has done, but really now taking this to the next level in terms of action. And to, and to overall expand the, the, the pool of resources, which is still far too limited in this area, because the demand is huge, particularly in the developing world. Next. And that's it. That's it for me. So uh, really look forward to your participation here today. Look forward to your input if your country is not a member of the, G, uh, of the uh, uh, GFC, uh, it's not hard to join. If your organization is not a member, it's not hard to join, join as a member or a partner. We welcome these efforts. Uh, we've expanded dramatically over just the course of seven years, but this is a really key, as again, as I said, this is foundational to everything else I think we're trying to do in this space, uh, both positive and fighting threats, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And that was fantastic to hear about the, first of all, the, the importance of networks bringing together the communities from um, development, typical development communities, as well as cyber communities and more policy folk. How can we make sure that they are working in partnership with one another? Um, I also really liked what you said about the demand driven approach and thinking about what are the issues that, that need to be done and how can we help to amplify what has already been done? You know, I think there's a, there's a supposition that you can you don't need to start from ground zero. You can you can build on other people's work already, and I think there's a need to do that. I also enjoyed hearing what you said about the importance of regional hubs and the importance of regional development work. And I also would love to pass over now um, to Mr. Yamauchi, um, who I know has done a lot of work, particularly with, with Japan, and how I'd love to hear a bit more about the work Japan has been doing at a regional level to promote more effective technical, strategic, and policy initiatives within cybersecurity. So Mr. Yamauchi, can I please pass over to you? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you uh, everyone here uh, joining this session uh, on-site and online. And uh, uh, thank you very much for, uh, for participating in the forum uh, as a, a member of the host. Okay, uh, yes. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, uh, for uh, the Japanese government, uh, we have just a cyber security strategy uh, every three year, and uh, now the existing uh, strategy was decided uh, 2021. Uh, this was just about the uh, uh, when we established the digital J agency to promote DX, and the, the just after the, the Tokyo Olympics Games, uh, just uh, that we have uh, successfully uh, operated the game. And uh, we have uh, three uh, major policy pillars, uh, one, two, three, and uh, three, uh, you can see the enhancing initiative from the perspective of the national security. And the, uh, this, under these uh, pillars, the, we have several specific measures, and uh, you can see the uh, number three, the international cooperation and the collaborations. And that uh, in these, uh, <clears throat> objectives, the supporting for capacity buildings, uh, we we uh, we focus uh, the activities for the capacity buildings in especially for uh, Indo-Pacific regions. So uh, I can uh, I would like to explain the how we uh, extend or uh, have the. Uh, capacity building activities for uh, ASEAN countries. The next slide, please. The, we have uh, not only the MIC, my ministries, but also the whole, the holistic, the uh, policy makers in Japan to uh, have the uh, uh, cyber security capacity building activities. And uh, you have uh, several 
uh, activities that from one to ten, and the the number five that capacity building working uh, there. And I would like to uh, emphasize the uh, the last column so you can see the lead countries. Uh, of course, now uh, the Japan has uh, about more than half the items. But you can see Indonesia, the Brunei, or the Thailand for several items. So that means the uh, ASEAN countries have a uh, voluntary intention or ability to lead these uh, activities. So we expect the, the, the ASEAN countries has more uh, abilities or uh, incentives to promote such kind of uh, cybersecurity initiatives. OK, uh, next slide, please. Uh, this, uh, I'd like to explain the AJCCBC, the Asia, uh, ASEAN Japan Cybersecurity Capacity Building Center, uh, established in Bangkok. Uh, this is a very uh, busy slide, I'm sorry. Uh, the major activities at the center uh, we have two uh, major pillars. The one is a cybersecurity exercise, uh, the other is a cyber sea game. The, the first one, the cybersecurity exercise, uh, we have originally uh, the called the CIDER exercise. Uh, this is uh, established and organized for Japanese local government. Uh, this is the uh, uh, very uh, uh, rea realistic uh, uh, exercise, and uh, we revised the CIDR program to uh, <coughs> to uh, for the, uh, the ASEAN countries. And the, the second one, the Cyber Sea Game, uh, this is in order to promote the activities for younger age, uh, especially for students or uh, the higher educated people. Uh, we have con uh, conducted, we have been conducting the CTF style contest and uh, we promote uh, them to uh, have the more the advanced capacity uh, in, uh, ex <coughs> in uh, executing uh, such kind of sea games. And uh, now uh, we have the more than two, uh, two thousand, uh, no, no, no. Sorry, 1,200 people participated in uh, as of uh, August this year. And uh, now, uh, from this year, the, from this e uh, fiscal year, uh, the uh, uh, centers, the, the operation of the center uh, was uh, transferred to JICA, a uh, subsidiary of the MOFA, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and uh, Foreign Affairs. And uh, uh, MYC uh, is uh, continuously providing uh, the contents uh, to the centers. And uh, we now we are considering to expand this kind of activities to uh, Oceanian countries, uh, especially for the northern part of the uh, Oceanian countries. Now we are talking with the uh, uh, neighboring countries, uh, including uh, the United States and uh, Australia, the how to operate uh, such kind of activities. OK, uh, next slide. Uh, this is uh, the end of my explanation. And uh, thank you uh, very much for your attention. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Yamuchi. And it was fantastic to hear about the work the AJCCBC has been doing, um, and also the work in CTFs and the exercises and the, how you are helping to scale that across the regional area. Um, it's a fantastic endeavor, and I, I look forward to hearing more in the questions afterwards. Um, I'd love to drill down into a bit more detail um, with uh, Ms. Ms. Shinoda, um, who is the founder of, of, uh, of Blue Code Blue Events and Blue Inc. Um, I'd love you to hear a bit more about some of the work that you're doing at Code Blue events and helping to build partnerships with the technical community and also your work with uh, with youth development. So, Ms. Shinoda, can I please pass over to you? Yes. Uh, thank you. 
um, I would like to talk about three stuff. I mean, three project. One is Code Blue, and then one is GCC, and then the last one is ICC and the ACSC. Okay, uh, Code Blue is an international conference in Tokyo. It's been uh, this year. Uh, it will be eleventh this year, and it will be happening next month. And uh, we invited the two keynotes this year, like uh, Miko Hippone from no, uh, Finland and then um, Sergi Korsunski, uh, ambassador of Ukraine to Japan. Uh, those two will be the keynote. And then uh, we're going to have the 35 sessions and the 42 speakers. And also three contests and then some other CTFs and car hacking villages too. So it's like a Black Island DEFCON mixed uh, conference. And um, the, the Code Blue itself is a very top global event and a workshop and then a contest in cybersecurity. And um, it's been doing like, um, uh, first, first time it was like a very, very technical oriented. But uh, since we thought uh, we need to uh, mix more law and policy people and the cyber crime people too, I mean, so that's why we mixed, uh, we built a law and, uh, law and policy truck and then the um, cybercrime truck. Um, that's why we uh, try to mix those people all together in the one venue uh, to change the society faster by, you know, um, let them talk together in the same field. And um, uh, also uh, to cultivate the young people we hire, uh, we set up like U25 youth sessions, uh, two sessions, and then we build, uh, we created um, scholarship. We say the Code Brew Research Grant. Uh, if they are really good speaker and uh, really good to research, we're gonna uh, give them some grants from from the Code Brew. So. And also, at the same time, we hire the uh, student staff too. We hired this year 34 student staff to, um, to involve more young people to the cybersecurity industries too. Um, mostly like a high school students, the university students are coming here to, um, they work one day and then they listen one day. So they have enough time to talk with speakers and then the, the people at the booth, like industry people, and also they, uh, they, have, they make friends among those students, staff too, uh, who is coming from all over Japan. The student staff is very popular among the uh, young kids. And uh, we, we, have on, we hired only 34 students, but we have three times more applications for it. So it's very popular. So um, we created um, Code Blue because the, uh, ten, about 10 years ago, um, security uh, in Japan, the, it, we kind of like, uh, I felt like that we have a lot of taboos in Japan. Like they don't fully open to talk about security. Like for example, um, automotive security stuff, even the, like uh, America, they talk about uh, car hacking stuff already, but uh, in Japanese media, they don't publish that much about it. So I try to make the security a little higher in Japan. So that's why um, I try to make it like a international conference English and Japanese equally. Um, that's why uh, I'm named it Code Blue. Code is a technology, blue is ocean. All the borders in Japan is on the ocean. That's why we name it that, that way. So that's, uh, that's about it. And can you do the next one, please? Okay, this is the sponsors from, for this year. Uh, you you can see like a Panasonic, Hitachi, NECs, and those, and then the banks, and a lots of um, Japanese global companies are supporting us, and also some other uh, companies from overseas also interested too. So, next slide, please. Ah, can you go back a <laughs> slide? I, I forgot to mention the the just for the supporters we have automotive. Um, association um, here now. So, yeah, I just want to mention it. Yeah. 
can you next? Uh, thank you. This is just a uh, snapshot from the code rule. It's a before COVID-19, so that's why people are so uh, close together. So you see some people uh, playing with soldering stuff, and they're making like hardware hacking stuff. And then the, some people are uh, working together, you know, the you know, internationally, smiling and uh, working on the CTFs. And uh, some people are standing and watching about um, some tools, uh, some tool talks. And we have, at this time, we had about uh, 1,000 people in one room. So it was, um, it was the COVID-19. So next slide, please. And this is a uh, part of the snaps also. And because the code blue is always happening the Halloween uh, period. So that's why some uh, people are joining with uh, dinosaur suits. <laughs> so we're having fun with that way. And uh, some people, the, you know, the left down corner, it, they are playing the CT very seriously. So it's like that. Thank you. Next slide, please. Yeah. So uh, that's about code blue. So next one is GCC, the Global Cybersecurity Camp. It's a one-week training camp for Asian, uh, uh, Asian youth. And then it's an Asian version of security camp in Japan. It's been already five years. Um, global camp is like, um, sort of now. Uh, yeah, you see the from left, we have eight countries already. Uh, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, Australia, Malaysia, Thailand, and Vietnam. Um, those are member countries, and uh, we're going to have the Indonesia and India probably from, ne uh, from next year. And those are uh, various type of organizations, like uh, uh, from Japan, we have uh, security camp is joining. Security camp is like an NPO in Japan, and then like uh, Taiwan, they are, um, it, it's like a, a government education project too. And South Korea also government government project too, and then some others are uh, community and some others are uh, university. So it's very mixed. Uh, uh, people are uh, supporting and then joining the GCC. Each country select like six or seven students, and uh, we came all together in one place, and then uh, we do the one week training, and uh, we give them the one week training and uh, whole uh, cutting edge trainings too. But at the same time, we have the group work for all students to make them talk a uh, whole entire week. So, for example, group work was like um, how to foster the friendship among uh, Asian countries or uh, to think of the future careers of themselves too and that kind of stuff. Yep, and then also this is, the, um, yeah, as, as I said, it's a model of the security camp in Japan. Uh, security camp in Japan is held like it's been 13, over 13 years already. It's one, one senior year, and it's just uh, one week. But um, I created this one because the security camp is very succeeding in Japan. It's mixed uh, uh, with uh, uh, academia and uh, industries and then... Um, yeah, and the communities too, and then the um, ecosystem working very good. Like uh, students, after graduate, they becoming the trainers or tutors, and so we don't have to train the trainers. But we even uh, we by doing the security camp, they come back to the community because they want to be. Uh, so that that's how it works, and it works like that in GCC. GCC itself is like uh, um, the students. Uh, are coming back and they're being the trainer and sponsor and also the staff too. Now I'm kind of uh, just a step a little bit aside and then they let them work. So they, because of friend friendship, they work smoothly over the countries. Okay. And because the cybersecurity is, we've been uh, te I mean, teaching kids uh, in the community for a long time, that's uh, the nature of the cybersecurity here in the community. So that's why, because it's pretty, because of it, uh, it's pretty natural for us to uh, get together and then um, teaching them together voluntarily. Okay, next slide, please. And uh, uh, this one is the GCC students. It's about uh, 50 or 60 size of the class. Yeah, 
And uh, it's going to be Thailand in 2024, February. Next one, next one. Yeah, next slide, please. And ICC and GCC, uh, no, ICC and SCSC. Uh, cyber it's a, ICC is an international cybersecurity challenge. And it's a CTF World Championship where representative uh, teams from the continuous uh, compete, competitions. And it's actually, the ICC is founded by uh, ENISA, actually. ENISA had ECSC, it's a European Cyber Security Challenge. It's also CTF among European countries. And then they've been doing good, and they're confident to uh, expand it to the global level. So that's why uh, they created the ICC in, uh, the first meeting was 2020 February. And then, then uh, we started to expand this way. Um, uh, we had uh, seven teams from each region, like one from Europe, one from Africa, one from South America, and so, so, so and so forth. Um, from Asia, we have eight countries. And then, yeah, for next round, we had, we had, um, Thailand last year, but uh, they were kind of um, decided to leave. And uh, India was part of us, but India has a huge population, so they will make their own team to participate in this one. And then the final round will be uh, sometime in 2024, and it will be probably in Dubai in Middle East. We had a Middle East team, but they, they couldn't participate in America this, uh, this year, so probably. Middle East, but we haven't decided yet. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Next slide, please. Sorry, it takes time. Um, uh, this is a team Asia uh, from the first ICC Athens, Greece, and then uh, you know on the left side you see the overall results. Europe was first, Asia was second, and the USA was third. And then uh, the interesting thing is the Asian team won the Atakan defense. And then Jeopardy quiz is second. Even we didn't have a chance to train the team, and we even didn't have a uniform altogether. But uh, they were uh, they did a very good job. And then next slide, please. And this one was uh, from this year, uh, ICC, uh, held in San, uh, San Diego in the United States, and supported by US government. And the over res uh, result is that Europe is first, and Oceania is second, and the team is third. And for attack and defense, we won the first place only uh, again. So maybe because we selected the uh, finalists, uh, 17 finalists among the, um, among 14 competitors from the one CTF. So that that's why they are really good at attack and defense. I think. Yeah. yeah thank you. Sorry, text. On. Thank you very much. Um, that was fascinating. And I can see a lot of consistency um, with Mr. Yamauchi's presentation about the importance of um, uh, war games and uh, scenario planning and how can they competitions and CTFs be a helpful exercise to help boost capacity uh, also in a regional level. Um, thank you so much also um, to Mr. Yamauchi for presenting about the AJCCBC as well as to Mr. Painter for talking about of the work on the um, Global Conference on Cyber Capacity Building, which is happening in Ghana in uh, November, as well as the Sybil Programme, which sounds fascinating as a way for policymakers around the world to access uh, materials that have already been created and to build partnerships with experts to help them address their, their own challenges. And I think the demand level approaches or demand based approaches is a really important point. Um, I, thank you so much for the presentations. I, I, it's been fascinating for me and I'm sure it has for everyone else in the audience. Um, what I'd love to do now is to just delve in a bit more detail into some of the challenges that we know exist. Um, you all have a great deal of experience working with partners in cyber capacity building. So what I'd love to just ask the panel, um, perhaps starting with you, um, Mr. Painter, is what are the, some of the key challenges that you find you know, when you're facing regional capacity building initiatives? What, what are the key challenges that, that you see coming up again and again in, in your experience? Well, one is getting a sufficient level of, I think, policy and political buy-in in a country because uh, as much as they may need capacity building help, uh, if you don't have that buy-in, you're not going to have the sustainability. So, so making sure that there is 
that it's not just the experts you're talking to, although they're important to talk to, but getting that, that buy-in at a higher level. That's one. Resources, as I said, are a continuing challenge that uh, not enough resources are devoted to this given the huge demand of countries around the world and the need for better information sharing. So efficiency and coordination is really important, and that's what we're trying to do in my organization. But really expanding that pool, I think, is really important. I think the third one I'd mention is just breaking down the silos I talked about between the technical community, the policy community, the innovation community, the security community, and the development community, and the cyber community. So all of those, I think, are, are challenges. They're not challenges that can't be overcome, but they're ones that really take concerted effort because this really is something that's critical to the growth of economies, of societies, uh, and we need to address it now and treat, not treat it simply as an afterthought, which I think too often we've done in the past. Thank you very much. Um, would any other panelists like to contribute on that, that, that topic? Okay. In which case, oh, Ms. Schneider? Yeah. Um, I kind of agree with him. Like, uh, uh, it's the security is a process, and um, it's never ending. So uh, we collaborate together. We have to dis uh, we have to discuss all getting all together. So I totally agree with him. Great, thank you. Um, and so to Mr. Yamauchi, um, based on you know the important role, the important role of um, efficiency in helping you know generate resources and getting that political buy-in. Um, how do you think countries like Japan can support um, developing countries um, more as we look to deliver initiatives in cybersecurity? Okay, uh, from the government side, uh, I think uh, they need two, uh, two issues. The one is uh, what kind of policies do they need? And the second is the, uh, the how do they make uh, some such kind of policies. So once they are uh, determined, uh, I think we have a sufficient content uh, filled in the uh, restrictive policies, and uh, we can uh, make some kind of uh, restrictive initiative uh, like AJCCBC. So uh, in this slide, uh, the ACCCBC is at the technical uh, capacity building. So before that, we need some kind of holistic uh, capacity building for the government side. That's my comment. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, so I think that's we're talking about the important role of um, foundations in a policy level as well as the technical on top and how we can make sure to Mr. Painter's point, we are breaking the silos between those communities more effectively. I think something that's come across in this, this panel already is that there is a lot of work that is already happening and, and lots of different initiatives, whether they are competitions or capacity building conferences or other programs to support partnerships between, or between policymakers. So, uh, 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 as we said before, an important part of this is using your existing resources efficiently. So how can we make sure that, uh, it, given that all of these challenges are global, how can we support and amplify what has been seen to work well? So how can we think what has really worked and what would you like to see amplified in a greater at a greater scale? So Ms. Shinoda, can I ask you a bit more about things that you think have, have really worked and you would like to see grow at a, at a greater scale? Yes, um, since I'm from the community side, I really like to, um, like uh, uh, Chris mentioned, like a uh, mixed up people all together. It's very important. So that um, I see that Japan is a really good case to, uh, we kind of mixing like uh, community and the government and the academia all together. I've seen it. But some countries are having a hard time. I mean, I see some wo um, walls that divide it. So person to person or people to people, they talk together, but uh, um, 
some countries may need some bridge between to work together with government and the community because community has a lot of resources and trainers and the reach to the students too. It doesn't have to be you know, some develop, developed countries. Uh, they are not uh, rich enough to go to school, right? And then, so those people who don't go to school but they have a really good talented you know people there out there, so the community can reach there and reach them and even it. It's going to prevent them to go to the underground. So community, government, uh, academia, all together working is very good. And uh, you, we can, uh, like, uh, with help with uh, Chris and then um, Yamanaka-san's, um, we can help them to bridge all together, perhaps. Thank you. I, I think it's really coming through as a theme, the importance of building those communities and having networks um, that bridge existing communities and skill sets. Um, so Mr. Yamuchi, I would love to understand from your perspective, how you think the international policy community can help better amplify the success of initiatives that have had impact. Uh, thank you. Uh, as uh, you can see the uh, slide two of my uh, presentation. Uh, for example, now uh, between the ASEAN and Japan policy makers, we have 10 uh, working groups. So it's important for us to uh, enhance uh, and or enrich the content and so they can know or they can obtain the much more uh, nourishment. And the second, is, uh, it's important for us the uh, so the so-called teachers uh, to uh, expand the uh, 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 the target countries. So now uh, we see ASEAN countries and the uh, the Oceanian countries, but we need to expand the target. So as the previous uh, presenters, that they have the global coverage, but the from the government side we see some missing countries. So it's important for us to extend and fill the gap. That's my comment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and Mr. Painter, you were talking about the, the work of Sybil and how that is helping to support policymakers to identify what has already been done in the area that may be of interest to them. It, do you have any thoughts about you know, one issue that you think has really seen to work or one program that's really worked? You'd love to see amplified more that you can share with us? So I'd say, uh, you know, just more generally, that having the multi-stakeholder approach has been very helpful because governments are doing a lot of work in this area, but they're not the only ones. There's civil societies doing a lot of work, private industry has, so bringing them together, I think it's been a good way to do that. Another thing that I think we found is uh, the enemy of, of progress, I think, is one-offs. Just doing things, doing a program and saying, okay, we're done, and then you come back five years later, and then any momentum we built is gone. So I think building that sustainability, which goes to the political buy-in, but also goes into just having a program, creating something sustainable in countries has really been important, and that's been good. And you mentioned Sybil, I think having that information sharing platform, but also looking for gaps, and we were organized around working groups, one on cybersecurity, uh, I mean, one on um, uh, national strategies, and, and has a subgroup on diplomacy, one on uh, incident response and building certs, one on cybercrime, one on standards, and one uh, on awareness training and um, uh, workforce. Uh, organizing and rounding those themes and getting uh, folks to talk about that and sharing what they've done has helped a lot too. So I think all of those have had some real practical benefits uh, and we wanna continue to build on those and make sure that this is not just one-off conversations, but uh, a, a long and sustained conversation, building on all the great work that's being done in Japan, uh, which the other speakers have talked about, focusing more on the region. I think that's been very helpful too. Um, we're having our, um, our annual regional meeting uh, next week in Singapore at Singapore Cyber Week for the ASEAN countries. Uh, and so that, that's an important way to ground what's happening globally in a more local environment. And I think that two-way communication has worked and is important as well. 
Great, thank you so much. Um, I'm aware that we're running quite short on time. So what I'd love to do is, is now look towards the future because as we all know, one thing that's for certain is the future is very much uncertain um, and all countries need to, de to develop further capacity to face these challenges, um, whatever in format they may take. So of course, there's a lot of interest now in artificial intelligence, um, but there's also other questions that are being brought out because of, as we said, the, it, into the ongoing interconnectedness between um, all elements of public life, whether that is um, infrastructure or then moving into the home more broadly. So, Mr. Yamuchi, I would love to ask you, from your perspective, what trends do you think will lead the next three years? And what can policymakers do now to build future capacity in light of these trends? OK, thank you. Uh, actually, now I see a, a lot of people participating here, but I think the international collaboration or uh, the capacity building programs uh, s remains as uh, still at an uh, early stage. So we need uh, the expansion or uh, advancement of the uh, uh, capacity building activities uh, will be needed. So uh, I need that the, uh, some kind of sustainabilities of the, the policies and the programs and activities so the Chris and the Kanasam, uh, we we need the uh, uh, some kind of the capacity building uh, in the uh, the private sectors, and uh, we need the collaboration between the private sector and the government side, and uh, we need to expand the contents, and we want these uh, uh, many many countries are uh, interested in, in these activities. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Painter, can I ask you about what you think for the next three years and uh, what policymakers can do now? Yeah, I mean, uh, first of all, I think we need to do a lot of work just to uh, satisfy the demand we already have. So uh, uh, not just look to the future, but also there's, look, there's lots of, there's still a huge gap in terms of needs versus resources versus delivery. And so we need to address that. Uh, I think we can leverage some of the challenges that are coming up. Um, I, I worry sometimes that we turn from uh, one bright, shiny light to the next, and AI is the new bright, shiny light, and everyone's like, oh, everything's AI. It is. It's important. But let's use that as, a, uh, as an action call to say, well, because of the challenges that AI poses and the opportunities, that the kind of basic cybersecurity capacity building, the basic breaking down the silos between communities is something we need to do now. So not treated as just a whole new whole set of risks and opportunities, but folded into the conversation we already have to make this, again, stronger and sustainable going forward. So that is exactly what the Global Conference on Cyber uh, Capacity Building uh, is meant to achieve, to break down those silos, to have greater attention to this and have that longer term future view that this is not a separate thing. This is something that is important as we have any of these conversations going forward and we look at any of both the threats, but also the technological developments. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think your, your point about leveraging AI as a need to sort of generate political will to help get the basics right is really, really critical. Um, Mishinoda, can I ask you? Yes, um, I kind of agree with the AI stuff too. And then uh, I, I was fascinated about the US government's trial, I mean, by the GABA, uh, not a DAPA. <laughs> AICC, like um, just, uh, just cyber grand challenge stuff. And I love that. I love to see the result in two years later. So, and that's the one, and that's a trend for three next three years. And then the other one for the cyber uh, security capability building is that I like to see, uh, Chris mentioned the duplications. That's the key word. I think a lot of countries are, you know, offering a lot of yeah, similar trainings to one country, the other country, the other countries. It's a duplication I see. And I think we, we have a, like a one platform and they put the, you know, the trainings all together. Uh, and like, um, yeah, we have lots of trainers and training contents. Yeah, if there's a one platform, we can collaborate all together on the training contents. That, that, in that way, we don't have to, you know, worry about the duplication and then that even the country, the, the country uh, having, um, you know, a lot of time to, you know, digest all the training materials too. So I like to see that one, that kind of uh, collaboration in next three years. Thank you.
Thank you very much. And I'm aware we're running very close on time. Um, so we, I think, only have time, if possible, for one question. Is there any quite burning questions in the room? Or... So if if not, what I'd love to do is just to, to, to round up and, and say a really huge thank you um, to our three panellists. Um, so Ms. Kana Shinoda, uh, Mr. Christopher Painter, and also uh, Mr. Tumu Yamauchi. Um, thank you so very much for your presentations and your subsequent conversations. I found that a fascinating conversation. Um, thank you very much also to the MIC uh, in Japan. And thank you to everyone for joining in person or remotely. Um, I think what came through very closely for me was the importance of everyone mentioned the importance of networks, the importance of breaking those silos, and how can we how can we support one another to, as an army of, of, the, of the good and the willing who want to try and support capacity building to help um, generate political will and also help support uh, the efficient use of resources uh, in, in this space. Um, I'm really, really grateful, and I know this is a huge task, but one where I think there's a great amount of, of how can we support one another, how can we break down those knowledge um, gaps, and how can we, um, one, once again, to help to amplify what works and, and build towards um, a more efficient future. So thank you so very much, everyone, for your, for your presentations, um, and uh, I look forward to, uh, to continuing on this journey together, um, and uh, I wish you all a wonderful day. Thank you so very much.